glad to be in the house of the house of the Lord today. And you want to give God all the glory. Put your hands together and shout hallelujah. Sometimes we have to think about how good God has been and what God has done in our lives. Can you remember a time when God gave you a specific message? He just called you out in your sleep or something and gave you a message that changed your life. You were in one place operating in one paradigm and God shifted the paradigm for you and put you in another place. And then you ended up being like James Combs said, it was so great, I said I wasn't gonna tell anybody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. So as we come here, all of those to know James Cone was this brilliant theologian that passed away a few months ago and he wrote some books and all of them I've tried to read, even if I didn't understand them, I read them until I got some understanding. I still don't have all the understanding, but I know I need to, I have enough understanding to know I need to read them again, amen. So we come today to talk about my favorite person in the Bible is Peter. And Peter in chapter 11 has a wonderful experience, but in order to understand what happened to Peter in chapter 11, anybody in here know who Peter is? In order to understand what Peter did, you gotta go back and examine chapter 10 to understand, get the pretext for what happened with Peter. Peter was this wonderful disciple of the Lord and he had, God could, had touched Peter's life in so many ways. Everything Peter saw Jesus doing, he would either try to imitate him, he would talk about it, whatever. Peter was on the ball. Peter was always there. When Jesus said, come and follow me, Peter, Peter was right in there. So in chapter 10, you have this person, this centurion in, named Cornelius in Caesarea. And he's sitting there and he has a dream that something phenomenal was going to happen to him. And about three, he, he had this dream, an angel came to him saying to him, and he told him to go and send a message to Simon and ask Simon Peter to come. And as we look at this thing, have you ever been in a place and you know God was preparing you for something? And God go and prepare you for something, you don't know quite what it is. So they go and they tell them to go to Joppa. Well, we read last week that Peter had been in Joppa and he called Tabitha back to life from being there. And Peter had it going on. Peter was in this ministry and he's there in, in, in Joppa with this tanner named Simon working and he goes to this tanner, he's working there and he called, they called and he said, go send some people to tell Peter to come to your house. Got something for you. Isn't it wonderful that you are living your life in such, in such, such way with, with God that God will choose you and send someone and say for you to come to their house. He has a message for you. So Peter was about, and God prepares you before you get ready to go. So one day about noon, Peter was up on the roof snoozing and God sent him a message. See, God always have to do something to you to yank you out of the place where you are all the time. They call it, I guess, paradigm shifting. You know, you end up in one place, but God wants you to put you somewhere else and God has to work on you. So he has Peter up there. And mind you, Peter is a good person, but Peter's kind of locked in that place. There are some folk with Peter who has preeminence over other folk. Peter have come up thinking that there are some folk that deserve this, but there are others over here that don't do it. Oh, I'm probably talking to someone in here. Peter said, These are the, this is the way it was for Peter. So God took Peter up on the roof and gave Peter a vision. In chapter 10, it said Peter was there gnawing off. And God showed him a blanket, come, a sheet come down and it had all kinds of animals in it. And God looks at Peter and said, Peter, slay, kill, and eat. And Peter was locked into where he was and Peter looked at God and he looked at him and said, God, you know I had never ever put anything to my lips that was dirty, that was not clean, didn't meet the purity laws. You know I haven't done that. So God looks at Peter and said, Peter, you're dealing with human rules. <laughs> I got a new rule for you. Anything, I have never made anything that was unclean that I told you to eat, so he helps Peter out. So Peter is perplexed with this thing that he, he has seen. So in about the time he finished his dream, about the time he finished his dream, the boys show up from Cornelius' house. Now Peter is one thing and Cornelius is something else. <laughs> But Cornelius is double something else because Cornelius is in charge of a cohort. Cornelius is a, Cornelius is a centurion. 
Cornelius is the person in charge of the occupying force. Cornelius is the person that's not supposed to go there. Oh, you know how we are sometimes. We look at people when they find themselves in one walk of life and we look at them and we just place them there permanently. They can't break out of that thing. Oh, I'm talking, they can't break out and we look at them and say, they are supposed to be there. And if you can think about it, I know you're thinking about some people right now in your mind. The people right now in your mind, you've been riding down the street and you saw the people sitting along the side of the street doing crazy stuff. You go through some neighborhoods and there are people doing crazy stuff. The other day we were riding and talking in the car and we realized that we were, we were in one place and we rode back in Detroit and as soon as we got into Detroit, we saw people sitting there and the people that were in the car to me started to make comments and I said, whoa, wait a minute. They looked at me and said, what? I said, do you realize just what you said? We were where the green grass, the, the yards were manicured. <laughs> we were in a place where the streets didn't have too many potholes. We were in a place where all those things are. We look at them and said this, but the moment we crossed Eight Mile Road and ended up back where we were, we started to look at the people that were there. And oh, by the way, they look just like us. They just happened to be sitting on the side of the road with a bicycle and something else, and they look just like us, and all of a sudden, we're afraid of them. We can't deal with them, but what is that? So Peter had this thing to come to him and said, Peter, you may be a Jew, but I got some folk that I made that I need them to hear what you've experienced. And let's see what Peter has experienced. <laughs> Peter has walked on water. Peter has raised somebody from... Peter has called somebody back to life. Peter has done all kinds of stuff. Anybody have a testimony in them that somebody else need to hear? Oh, just go ahead. Has God done anything in your life that's extraordinary that someone else has to need? Let me help somebody. Anybody in here ever been broken, been sad, been depressed, been broke, no money in your bank Friday show up and you got no money? Monday show up, you got nothing to go, you've been sick and the doctors tell you we can't help you out because we've gone everywhere, but you're still here. Say Maya Angelou's poem, but still we rise. Doesn't care what kind of hell I go through, but still, because of the grace of God, I rise. Now you need to realize that you need to go tell somebody, but there are some things that hinder us. There are some things that hinder us sometimes. And we can't go where God wants us to go. So Peter has this dream. He finishes the dream. People come get Peter. He goes to Cornelius' house. And just before he gets there, and he gets there, and he goes to Cornelius' house, and he does what God sent him to do in Cornelius' house. Oh, hallelujah. You know everything. everything is wonderful. But Peter had a problem still. Peter left Cornelius' house, went back to where he was. Say he went back to where he was. He went back to where he was, he went up to, and the text says he went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers, one group of folk, criticized him. And let me see, here how it goes. Peter, what you doing over there with them heathens? Peter, why are you over there with them folk don't look like you? Why are you over there with those folk, Peter? Then you can be talking about folk that do everything. Some folk make the distinction because you stand up and you do the holy dance in the middle of the aisle. Why are you over there with them folk? Some folk, some folk, some folk speak in tongues. Why are you over there with them folk? Some folk get on their knees when they pray. Some folk pray too long. Some folk shout in the church. I was talking to someone the other day and, and they were saying that I went to the church and I was sitting there and the preacher was really getting on it and everybody was sitting there so quiet the spirit hit me. I jumped up and started shouting and someone came over and touched me and showed and said, we don't do that here. But yet we sang the songs. We sang the songs. So Peter's friends. See, Peter has got taken outside of where they normally are. Peter, the Lord told Peter, said, Peter, I haven't made anything. And Peter comes to know that God is no respecter. Wait, everybody say, God is no respecter of, and a person is more than a Baptist person. A person is more than a Methodist person. A person is a person that God created. And I come to believe that those people on the street that have never darkened the door of a church, they are God's people also. So here he goes and Peter says, Peter comes down and they're criticizing Peter and say, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Dr. William, that text always bothered me. And eat with them. 
You can go with them, you can go see them, but don't sit down at the table with them. This has been something that happened with, even with Joseph. For, 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 for Joseph, folk went down to Egypt. Oh, by the way, this is 2019, in 1619. Anybody know what happened? 1619, they brought you here. You couldn't eat from the same table, but you go, what? 1619, 400 years ago, this August, 400 years, we've been sitting here wanting to be at the table, but you're not at the table yet. So they tell Peter, why did you go and sit at the table with those undesirables? Well, y'all looking at me really funny, but when they have family reunions, there's some folk that you won't sit at the table with. When we have church picnics, there's some folk that you won't sit at the table with. And you need to get rid of that stuff because this is about community. And what the devil loves to do, they said the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. And they found that loose one that's sitting out there by itself that's got no help. Or he find a fragmented congregation and he destroys it. He says, so Peter says, hmm. And Peter began to explain to them, step by step. You have to tell somebody step by step what God has done for you. Oh, you have, just raise your hand. Can you remember step by step what God has done for you? I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. I was writing my dissertation. And I realized before I could write it, I had to go step by step what God had. And that thing got so, got so messed up for me. I got past about five years old and it scared me. I wrote and wrote and wrote and I said, well, this is enough. And I started to read it over and God said, you need to put that in there that you have forgotten. And finally God said, you know, you were afraid of that. You need to put that in there. And by the time I got through with it, Dr. Freeman, I got through with it and I looked at it and I'm going step by step. And here's what happens when you go step by step. <laughs> you walk step by step with the Lord. The Lord will let you know. The Lord will help you to understand. You thought you did it on your own, but you didn't do it on your own. If it had not been for me on your side, you wouldn't have made it. There's a famous printing that goes and it shows all these step, steps going and all of a sudden you don't see two and you ask what happened to the other. They said that's when the Lord was carrying you. And if you can't come to that place, you're not ready yet. But when you come to the place where you can go step by step and explain what God has done, said Peter said, he went step by step. Peter said, well, let me tell you. I went step, Peter went step by step. Peter said, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in the trance, I saw a vision. And in that vision, here's what happened. He's retelling the story. There was something like a large sheet came down from heaven, being lowered from by its four corners, and it came close to me. And I looked at it closely, and I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Can you imagine the Lord telling you to get up in the middle of all the stuff that you have written off? All the people that you have written off? All the opportunities that you have written off? All the time that praise his name that you've written off and said it's not appropriate for me to do. Can you imagine the Lord putting you in the midst of it and saying, stand up and preach the gospel. Stand up and slay and eat. Stand up and get your fear. Stand up and learn something from them. As I read this text, say, God ever put you in the middle of a people and, and he wanted you to understand how they understand him differently than you do? Oh, let me help somebody. I will always run around and I'd be really upset. I'd be upset because people tell me, you know, this gospel that you're looking at, it's not the, your gospel, it's the gospel of slave owners and all those things. And I look at it and then one day, it's like a dignitary. It's where they say, God say, I am God. I'm God of all. Everything that I made, he said, but this is what you need to understand, Jimmy. You can't understand everything. <laughs> you don't know everything. Just do what you do. Do what you do and do it good. Don't hurt nobody. Do what you do. You ever thought about what you do, what you do? If you can make apple pies good, you can't get mad at everybody else because they don't make apple pies like you. Just make your apple pie and share it with everybody. So we are running around here mad because we make apple pies and somebody else makes what, pumpkin pie. And we are going like, God don't like your pumpkin pie. He only like apple pies. So if you don't like apple pies, you're going to hell. Let me, I got news for you. 
I got good news for you. God is greater than we can, we, we can't put our head around God. You can't get a little bit around God. We can't understand God. God's love is incomprehensible. God's love is inexhaustible. God's love is that, and we are only here for a fraction of a time. And while we are here, we are fighting with each other because we want other people to be as ignorant as we are. I can't get over it. People talking about this and that and that. I go like, how do you know? Why are you there? So Peter said, here's what I saw. God took me outside of the place where we normally reside. <laughs> God took me outside of that which we normally understand. God took me to another place. And I know now, Peter said, Peter said, let me tell you, and this is a teaching moment for them. Every once in a while, you have to tell somebody what God has taken you through, how God has done. He said, Peter, get up. And he said, but I replied, by no means. God ever tell you to go somewhere and you go like, by no means. Can't do that, Lord. Why, Lord? Because this is what I understand. It's not the Lord that's limited. It's me. What's that song? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not me talking to you, but you talking to me. He said, by no means, Lord, nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Oh. My God. He said this happened three times. Peter got a thing with those three times, doesn't he? <laughs> then everything was pulled up again from heaven and at that very moment, three men, I like this, after he saw, saw the vision, after God does something in your life that's, that's one of, he just, that God does that, let you just sit idle. Get ready because God has prepared you for such a time is about to happen to you now. And he said, three men showed up to me and told me Cornelius wanted me to come over there. And I took some people and I went me over to Cornelius' house. And he said, as I began, he, he gets on down and he tells them what happened. They sent him to, they told him, they told him that this, told them to come and get him out of Joppa and bring him there. And Peter said, and as I got there and began to speak, <laughs> and as I got there and began to speak, wouldn't you like that to happen? As I got there and began to speak and the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. At the beginning. I like that. Just as it has fell upon us at the beginning. Reverend Adams, I, I really struggle with that text. At the beginning. You understand, at the beginning. When it happened at the beginning. It happened at the beginning. It was clear, pristine, and I could do it. But something happened. But something happened after the beginning. Anybody been filled with the spirit? Shot on Sunday and raised hell on Monday? At the beginning. At the beginning I knew what it was like, but then I hindered God. I hindered him working in my life because I brought where I was here and put it on there and said, God, this can't be right. I, I realize you fill me with your spirit, but, but this is not quite right. He said, and when it fell on us in the beginning. So Peter saying, in the beginning when the spirit had fell, if they had been there, which you did, but since they weren't there, then God is dependent on us to go tell them. And Peter said, what I tell you, he said, when the spirit told me to go and not make a distinction between them and us. Had the spirit ever told you to do that? To go and don't make a distinction between them and us because God created them the same as he created us. Oh, somebody need to help me now. He created them as he created us. And I better stop here for a moment. Just because he created them and he created us, he created all this, us as fallible beings. And there are some people that we look at and say they have lost their mind. They are crazy. We don't understand what they are doing and they are looking at and they are crazy. They don't understand what we are doing. We got a debate going now. Well, people will sit down and say, I can just swear to you, this is what Jesus and God look like. He's got hair that looks like this, and he got eyes that look like this, and he got legs that look like this, and he got life that look like that. And then when you go, know John, John said, you ought to love one another as I have loved you. 
It's right there in John. It says he has, you ought to love one another. So Peter said, God has told me that there is no respecter a person. We would get along a whole lot better if we look at each other and say all of us are fallible hoping human beings. We are messed up. Your mind's in one place and my mind's in one place and it's due to enculturation, the way people taught us to be here. But let's break that barrier. Let's come together. Let's be the people that God created us to be. I don't care what color you are. I don't care how big you are. I don't care what it is. God just, spirit just dwelled inside of this shell anyway. And the Bible tells me when this shell, when this earthly tabernacle, when it gets depreciated by days and it falls short and it can't hold your spirit anymore, your spirit is going to take rise from here and it's going to go somewhere to meet your Savior and it's going to left you leave your prejudiced body laying here. And they can bury you in cemeteries and if they don't like where you're buried because they place some people there that would not like you before, you can dig, your body remains up and take it somewhere. All it does is enhance your insecurities and your prejudices. But guess what? There's a day of reckoning coming. When God will have to ask you the question. When I ask you to go, would you go? <laughs> Did you have a piece of bread in your hand to feed the hungry? Lord, I fed the hungry that looked like me. He said, no, no, I had some children that were hungry too. I heard their groans all over the place. You need to go and feed them. So Peter comes in, he tells them, and he's really giving his homeboys a lesson. He's giving his home folk a lesson. You ever been called to give your home folk a lesson? You had to been called and, and tell your folks about loving somebody that they didn't like? Oh, somebody to look at you. Any, any young man in here, raise your, Brother Hill, raise your hand. There he is, Brother Harrison Hill. And if I talk to Brother Hill when he was a teenager, I can guarantee you, he probably took some girl home to meet his parents that his parents didn't like. Or he talked about one that they didn't like. Not you, Sister Hill, where you at? I can remember, I'm from Louisiana, see? And I can remember telling, talking to my mom, and mama asked me where I'd been, and I mentioned some girl's name, and she looked at me and said, what's her last name? I said, why would you want to know that? She said, boy, you better tell me who she is, because you might be related to her. <laughs> you know, you had two granddaddies, <laughs> and between them, <laughs> They were rolling stone. So I told my mom, she looked at me and said, uh-uh, not here. You know, I, I wanted to tell her, it's okay to be kissing cousins. She said, uh-uh. <laughs> well, I'm saying, but there were other times when we introduce relatives, when we introduce people, and folk look at you and go like they're not who they ought to be in my eye, so you can't do that. And then you have to tell them about it. This is a wonderful person. I met them here. We did this, and one of the best things to do is that she went to church with me. Oh, that's getting on somebody's good side then. We went to church with me, and we pray together, and we do all these things, we plan together, and we are looking for you. You have to help people along the way. She believed this, and although she may be different than we are, she will bring a dimension to this family that will enhance our family. Then that means you sitting down, reasoning together, and helping people get over their stuff. Somebody's sitting here now, Someone is entered in your life that made a great difference in your life and you introduce them, they came into your family and they are the greatest asset that you've ever had right now. If that happened to anybody, just raise your hand. If not, just stomp your feet. You know it. So here go Peter. Peter's trying to help his other people. Saying those Gentiles over there, they deserve to be the Lord too because here's what happened when I told them about Jesus. <laughs> when I told them about Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell up on them and they acted just like we did when we first met. And Peter said, now I know. Peter said, now I know. He will give you. Peter said, they, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who I was, who was I that I could hinder God? Who was I that I could hinder God? Have you ever hindered God in anything? Have you ever hindered him? If God ever told you that somebody's worthy to hear the gospel and you felt that you couldn't tell them 
because of the situation of life that they find them in. Has God ever told you that someone to be worthy to be loved and you forgot that God loved you before you loved him? Has someone ever been hurting and you forgot that you were hurting and God came in and it was a bomb, put about a bomb and killing you for you? Have you ever been in a place where folk didn't want you there and then God came in and said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Have you ever been somewhere and people they thought you didn't God made you think that you weren't all that you could be and you realized that God made you in his image. Have you ever been somewhere and you didn't think you had nothing to offer but when you open your mouth and you start to tell them about how good God has been, somebody came to know that regardless of what situation I am, there is a God that looked past my, my insufficiency, that looks in that God is a God above my understanding. There is a God that touched the lives of what I consider the least of those in my midst and make a way out of no way. Yes, he did. Some of the things that God has allowed you to understand, people who you didn't particularly think had anything to say. As I look around, you ever looked around and just heard the testimonies of people? We didn't do Worthy is he, and not for his mercy, then nothing. 